Okay, we are going on. So now we are going to see how to design mechan mechanically a blade. So how is the procedure to design a blade? At first, uh, we have to determine the most critical operative condition. The, an aircraft and uh, an engine is doing a lot of things in uh, his mission. He starts uh, in idle condition, then he's doing some taxing operation, then he's do the takeoff, uh, cruise, and then the landing. So we have to detect which is the most uh, condition, the, the, the condition that stresses for the most the, the component. Then uh, we have to evaluate the stress in the parts and uh, the stress that uh, we can see in a, in a blade are usually coming from three sources. The inertial loads that uh, are coming from the, the centrifugal forces for the blades and some other stresses are relative to the aircraft maneuver. It moves uh, in his mission and so it, uh, it uh, applies some forces to the component. Then other stresses are thermal loads. <coughs> we have high temperature and often we have also gradient in temperatures and it is translated in, uh, in the part, in the component, uh, with uh, some stresses. And then we have the stresses coming from the air that flow down in the flow path. Turning the air is, is a force that the blade applies to the air and then the air applies the same force to the blade. So now we have uh, evaluated the stress and we have to compare this stress with the material capability. How much the material can uh, resist the stresses? We have to compare stress and capability of the material. The capability depends, of course, from the material. Different material have different capability. From the temperature in which the material is operating and also from the number of cycles that are required to that material. Because the engine is doing a lot of cycles, it uh, is doing a lot of flight, so it uh, determines the, the cycle uh, that uh, we require to the material. So, for what regard the operative condition, I was uh, saying uh, previously that uh, are these ones. So, the engine start from the uh, from shut down, then you go to the idle, that is the minimum power, zero power provided to the engine. Then we have a takeoff. The takeoff here, it is the highest point in this chart in which you can see the rotational speed of the engine, so the turbine, with respect to the time of the mission. So higher RPM means higher centrifugal forces. In this chart, you cannot see the temperature, but uh, the temperature is uh, proportionally, proportional to the RPM, let me say, because if you want to rise the rotational speed of the engine, you need to have more fuel in the burner, and then you have higher temperature in the turbine. So, then you have a top of climb, the higher plane is uh, climbing and then it reaches its, uh, its maximum uh, altitude and it starts uh, to reducing the power and here we have the cruise. The cruise is the most of the mission, is the stationary point of the of operative condition of the engine in which you want to have the highest efficiency. You have to reach the highest efficiency in cruise, but uh, you can uh, have lower efficiency in the higher, in the other point of the mission because you cannot have the higher efficiency in all the operative conditions. You have to choose, and you choose the most long uh, point of the mission. Then you have the, the landing, some uh, thrust reverse, and then you shut down the shut down the engine. So, takeoff, I was saying, is the highest point here in this chart, and the, it is the most stress uh, condition for, uh, the, for the turbine. In addition, when uh, the, the engine is deteriorated, the performance are not so good. So, to reach the same performance, you need to push 
for the engine. So when the engine is deteriorated, the cough is even more aggressive. And we call, we used to call this point red line. It is a, a deteriorated takeoff, nothing more. Okay. So, we have uh, detected the most aggressive operative condition, and then we have to find uh, the, the source of the stress. For the nozzle, we don't have so much inertial forces, we don't have centrifugal forces. So the stress source is mainly made by gas forces, the load of the gas, and thermal loads. Thermal loads is uh, high in the, the first uh, portion of the turbine because of higher temperature, then temperature drops going into the turbine, and then in the, lowest, the last stages, thermal loads are uh, so low. But uh, let me say that gas loads is always the high component of the stress in the nozzle. So, let's focus on the gas load in the nozzle. So all the static parts are connected to the case. So the nozzle, the hair fall of the nozzle are connected from the top to the case. And we can see it as a cantilever beam joint in the tip. This beam is, uh, gas forces are applied to this beam. So here we have the forces of the gas. But actually, it is not a concentrated force. You have no You have a distributed gas load on this beam, that is the hair foil. So, the, the stress, section by section, is increasing in this direction. Here, you see the shear stress in this beam, section by section. The higher stress is here, at, the, at its joint. Let's imagine something like that, if I push here, I will break my, my arm there. So, and also the moment with a parabolic uh, behavior is increasing section by section. Also for the moment here, you have the most stressed uh, section. So, the moment is the highest uh, source of stress for, uh, for an air foil. So we have to evaluate how this moment will become stress for the material. You have the air foil that you are doing. Usually we we think in, uh, in conventional axis, there are the axial direction of the engine and another that is, uh, in this case, the tangential direction. But uh, when we think, uh, when we want to evaluate the structure, we don't refer our coordinate uh, system to that one, but we prefer to refer to another reference system, that is the inertial reference system, internal inertial. <laughs> this principal <coughs> this principal reference system is for an iPhone something like that. And why is this uh, reference system special? Because in this reference system, if I apply a moment in this direction. I don't have any component in the other direction. And it is uh, something that happens if uh, I don't use uh, this uh, reference system. So these are the principal axes for an iPhone. So at the end, I have a moment here that is the reaction to this gas load that in the other view, that is this one, is uh, something that I can fit in a moment in this direction and a moment in this other direction. 
So, the stress in every point of the airport is directly proportional to the moment in the axis. The distance from the axis, but the higher is the inertia in that direction, the lower is the stress that I got. So, at the end, I sum the contribute for the moment in one direction, and the, the contribute in the opposite direction, and I obtain the stress for the, for the component, for the hair foil. Usually, these two directions are not equal. I have an, uh, an axis, a direction that, is, uh, that has a lower, much lower inertia. And much lower inertia, because of uh, here it is in the denominator, means higher stress. Let's can I mean, uh, let's think about a film like that. This axis and this axis. In this axis, I have a much lower inertia respect to this one, because inertia is proportional to the, to the third power of the distance between the axis at the end of the thickness okay, of the section in the dynamism. And for the airfoil, is the same. Now I saturate with the cover too, but sometimes we have something like that. And so, this is very similar to that one. So this is the axis of the minimum inertia. So the distance from this axis determines the great portion of the stress in the section. And that is important. So usually the most uh, stressed part are here, because it's uh, far from one axis and far from the other axis, and uh, the opposite side, for the same reason. Leading the edge of the airfoil and leading the edge of the airfoil are the most stressed part in our airfoil. If you, if you want to reduce the stress, you have to increase the inertia of the section. So the, the stress for a nozzle is led mainly by the inertia of the section, and most of all, the minimum inertia. If you want to rise the inertia, maybe I can rise the curvature of the nozzle, something like that, or increase the thickness of the nozzle. That are two kind of things that I can do. But every change in the in the hair for, for mechanical reason is often maybe always uh, not good for aerodynamic reason because aerodynamics wants most of times thin hair foil and we want to guide the fluid in a such a way so we cannot change aerodynamics too much but of course the blade the nozzle has to survive so we have to at the end. So, the blades is uh, quite different. For the blades, we have uh, two stress sources. One that is the centrifugal load and gas load. Here, thermal load is uh, not, so, not so high, let me say. So, the main component of stress is the centrifugal load. Uh, here, you can see apply the centrifugal load in the center of gravity and the gas load in the center of pressure in the hairfoil, but as in the nozzle, it is not a concentrated uh, stress, but is a distributed stress also for the blade. And uh, as uh, for the nozzle, we can think a blade as a beam, but this time we have not shear stress, we, we are not uh, worried about shear stress, but uh, the stress that is uh, worrying us is the centrifugal load, that is an axial stress. So, this is the hair foil. Okay, the hair foil is rotating in this direction now. This is the attach of the hair foil. I'm considering here a clamp as in the previous way. And here you have the thick shroud. Okay, 
the tip shroud is not a resistant part. We can think here in this scheme the tip shroud only as a mass that rotating produce a force for the other part of the beam. So, mass, center of gravity, and omega square is the force. Okay, for the other part of the beam, we have a loop that is increasing because every single section has a mass. So, every single section will load the previous section a little bit more because of its weight, because of its rotational speed. So, at the end, I have a concentrated load at the end of the blade, and then a distributed load. I draw it there, it's simple. For every section that is increasing. So, at the end, the load. <coughs> Also in this case, it is increasing, oh sorry, spoiler, it is increasing uh, <coughs> from the tip to the root, to the hub. I usually call hub this part of the blade. So what does it mean at the end in the design phase? The Kayak load that is something like that. I can manage this shape a little bit about it, something like that at the end. To make the blade survive, I need to enlarge the section of the high foil at the root, coming from the two feet to the root. So the section here is increasing, the arc the section. So while the world is doing something like that, they also have to, the thinking has to do the area of the section. Okay? This is good for two reasons. The one is because high stress, uh, to resist, uh, to survive to higher stress, I need to have higher section. The second uh, reason is if, uh, so the first is to increase uh, the section here. The other reason that uh, makes these things good is that if I make this uh, section uh, lighter, lower, this section will have a lower load for the other, for the other sections. So my, my objective, my aim is to make lighter as possible this part of the blade and resist enough resistance, not heavier as possible, of course, enough resistance this part. Of course, this part has to divide the the full load coming from the tip shroud. So this is the message. The, me the message is that here you have a thinner section and then at the root you have a thicker section. And this is, and this is important. Okay? So, vein and blade. What do we mean with the vein? And what do we mean with blades? They are the statoric parts. The starting one. Blades are the rotating parts. So, which is the most stressed part of a vein? The bottom or the tip part? For a, uh, what I say, the vein or a blade? Vein. For a vein, the static part of the bottom, you say. The vein is linked to what? Up or tip? Up is below, tip is the top. No? When is uh, fixed the vein? The vein is static and fixed at the tip to the casing. No? What did we say before? So, uh, which is the main stress, uh, what the, to what is due to main stress on the beam? Is it due to centrifugal stresses? No, because it's uh, static. So no centrifugal stress there, no inertia force there. No? 
is it, a, is it a due to tangential loads of the air? Yes, it is. Because you have to think that this is similar to a beam. You have a beam to which we apply a tangential force. And we need the tangential force. Because tangential <laughs> force is what uh, is uh, pushing the flow towards the blade. But the tangential force is all over the vein. The vein is fixed here, so you have a beam that uh, will generate the moment. Where is the maximum moment of this beam that is here fixed? Up or deep? It's deep. This is, uh, for an engineer, important. So, you have a, an applied force all over the road. The maximum momentum is here. So, the tip of the vein, because it's fixed at the casing at the tip, is the most critical one. Because this component is mainly stressed by high forces. Okay? So, if and this is for a beam. A beam which is uh, the most critical part of a blade, up or tip, because we have to think before answering which is the main cause of stress on a blade. No? For a beam, tangential loading. For a blade, are there any centrifugal stress on the blade? There are a lot, because the blade is running uh, very fast, generating centrifugal loads. So here, that's the main stress. And which is the most critical uh, section in this case? You have to think that this part uh, will be push. This one will be pushed, pulled towards the tip, but also we have this part to be kept. This part will be pushed by the centrifugal loading, but also pulled by these parts that will have to be kept linked. And so on. So the hub will have to sustain all this, uh, all the centrifugal stress uh, of these parts. So, the up is the most uh, critical section on a blade. Okay? What does it mean? Look, I designed uh, the meridional section and I did it uh, in a particular way. I'm not designing the profile, but I'm designing uh, this and this, the actual shorts. Did I make them uh, the same up and tip? No. The tip of the vein, I designed it uh, longer than the other. Why? Because if this is more critical in terms of stress, uh, I need more material to resist. So I made it long. On the contrary, I did the blades longer at the hub, so that I'll have more material to resist all the rest of the blade centrifugal loads. Also, this is axial shore, but also I do the iPhone here you look from here, thicker than here, and here thinner than here. Of course, they have to be mirrored one each other. No? So that here, this is longer, now I did not the same axial short, but should be, but also you have much more area than the tip, because this area will have to sustain all the centrifugal loads of all the upper parts. 
and this area will have will be subjected to a centrifugal a, a momentum due to the forces that of all the blades is a beam if i apply here this part is the most critical is it clear now so a vein which is the main cause of stress on a vein A vein is the sudden part, the main cause of stress on a vein is the law of the, the tangential law. The law of the air. And so, because it's treated as a beam, the most critical <laughs> is the tip. A blade, the source of stresses are the centrifugal loads. And it's the, the most critical point. It's, for me, it seems so difficult, the simple, sorry. But I see that you are not, uh, so I'm not able to give you this concept. That is a basic uh, So Tell me what you are not understanding. I try to make it even simpler. Simpler. <coughs> If you have a static part, a beam attached there, and on this you put uh, constant forces all over, and you plot on this different section the momentum. It's something like that, or linear, I don't remember. <laughs> something like that. No? So, the main stressed one, this section at the tip will have to sustain this momentum due to the constant uh, loads. Okay? And because the vein is only main, if we neglect the thermal loading, is only. Uh, sustaining these uh, forces because it's not rotating so much centrifugal stress there. I have to do the more loaded section thicker. So thicker and uh, larger in terms of axial load. On the contrary, the plate is linked to the disc at the arm and it's rotating really really fast so if i imagine my plane as a sum of uh, parts each of these parts uh, will be pushed by centrifugal loads towards the tip but the below parts will have will be pushing itself, but will have also to sustain the upper part, thanks to this intersection and so on. So this part uh, will have to sustain all the top parts, centrifugal loads. So the loads here will be maximum here. And so in order to do that, uh, the area distribution as a matter of the radius from here to here, will have to be minimum at the tip to reduce as much as possible the centrifugal stress that are proportional to the area and maximum to the arm to sustain all the other parts. At least one understood what we are trying to say. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no. Uh, so, what do we really need uh, when you go, will be asked to design a profile. If it is a vein, it will have to be thicker at the arm. If it will be a blade, it will have to be thicker at the tip. Sorry about the other side. Yeah, the opposite. 
Yeah, between the two outputs. It's always the phase, right? The phase of the, of the static point and the phase of the wave, right? The reaction point, uh, you think, yeah? Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's always the phase of the... Yeah, always the, the reaction point. So for the vein, the reaction point is at the tip, the clamp. Always where is the clamp? <coughs> okay. For the vein, the clamp is at the tip, most stress at the tip. For the blade, the clamp is at the bottom, at the hub, so most stress at the hub, so thicker section of the hub. That's if the restroom. Yeah? How do you We will see now. This is a very peculiar way to attach the blade to the disc. It's a very delicate point of uh, the design of a blade. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I go on. So, for the blade, we cannot uh, neglect at all the contribute of the gas load because mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, not so high as the centrifugal force, but uh, is uh, a, re a relevant uh, contribute in, uh, in the stress. But uh, I can use an eschematizer so, to reduce this contribute. So the organic way is uh, clamped here in the bottom. And it is a beam here, like that. So let's uh, consider a concentration uh, of the force here. So you have the centrifugal force that has a radial contribution. And then you have uh, the gas load that has a tangential and axial contribution. Okay? So the clamp at the end and then also the, the section at the end, that is the clamp, has to resist to a radial load and a gas load. And also, that is, uh, that is important, this uh, contributes because of its distance from the root, give us a moment, a moment. And so this section have to resist to a high centrifugal load, uh, a little bit uh, gas load, but uh, an important moment. Okay? The opposite time, but okay. I can do some, a thing to reduce uh, the value of the moment uh, acting after the gas load. That I can reduce this contribution. How can I do? If I bend a little bit the blade. What does it happen? Now I'm exaggerating this behavior. The reality is much less than this one. So, now what does I have? I have the centrifugal forces that now is acting at a distance from the clamp axial distance. And I have always uh, the gas load that is at the, always at the same distance, A and B. This time, what do I have? I have the same value for the, for the forces reacting here, because I have to compensate these, I have to react to this force and this force. I have not had any force. But uh, for what regards at the moment, the scenario is a little bit different and is good for us because now what, the, what do I have? I have, as before, the moment uh, made by the gas load. Okay? And I have also the moment, respect to this point, <coughs> made by the centrifugal load. And the sign is the opposite with respect to the previous one. So here I had I subtract this other contribute. But this is my moment. But the flood is given by iron. Also A is given by iron for uh, aerodynamic reason, it is the center of pressure. But I can choose B because I'm choosing how much I want to bend the blade. And so I can choose B, so how much I bend the blade, 
in a such a way that this uh, moment is zero. I can choose B. So why don't uh, I make it zero? I make it zero. So actually I can uh, almost neglect in a blade design, in a rotating blade design, the contribute of the gas load. And it is important because it is uh, something that I got for free. Not weight increase, uh, not any complication in the design, maybe a little bit loss of efficiency, but not so much. So it, uh, it's a very good thing. Okay. So, it's clear this uh, stuff. Do you have any question? I go on? Okay. So, now we saw how to evaluate the stress in a blade, in a rotating blade, and in a nozzle, so a nozzle is static blade. How, now we have to compare these uh, stresses with uh, the properties of the material. In that case, I have uh, to compare with uh, a lot of values, not only a single values, because the, the material can break in a lot of ways. Tensile, fatigue, resonances, flutter, and creep. We are going to see each one of these uh, this behavior of the material. So, tensile properties. The tensile is the simplest way to break a component. I have a beam. I clamp this beam. And I apply a load. If I increase the load, at the end the beam will break. Easy. But something, occ something occurs before the blade is breaking. At a certain point, the material starts to deform plastically. So at, the, at first, if I release in the first part, if I apply a low stress, if I release the stress, the material became as before applying the stress. It, it has not any <coughs> permanent deformation. If I increase the stress over this point, the material starts to have a permanent deformation even if I release the stress. Then if I increase more the stress, I reach the fracture point. So, for, uh, an, uh, for a component in the turbine, we of course don't want the, the rupture, but in most of component, because of aerodynamic reason, we don't want any plastic deformation, any permanent deformation. So we design for the most of the component in with the stress inside this value. Sometimes in some component, in some not critical point, we can exceed the yield if we don't need uh, a particular precision of depth, field, or media radius of curvature, we can exceed locally that values. But uh, we often want to remain under the yield. But uh, what are the load on the components? I previously said that we, we evaluate the load in the most aggressive condition, that is the takeoff. So we don't want to yield, to have a yield permanent deformation in the component at the most higher and most high stress in his life. But uh, can occur something. Um, so if uh, we have a rupture of a major component, let me say, if a blade of the fan, so the huge blade in front of the engine, will break at the hub, the blade we will uh, go like a bullet much heavier than a turbine blade and will impact in the engine. In that case, you will have huge loads in the engine, much higher than uh, the normal maximum of the operating stress. In that case, you only want that your uh, engine survives. You don't want a complete explosion of the engine. So you, you have to, to design some components, some blades, to resist to that stress the higher stress that you can have in case of a failure of a major component. Okay? So, well, fatigue. Fatigue is what actually breaks a lot of components in the engine. What is fatigue? Fatigue is a, a phenomenon that occurs when you have a cyclic load. So you have a... Okay. 
you have the component, the component has a load because of the centrifugal, because of the gas load, because of a lot of things. So he has an average load in that quantum of emission. Then there are other loads that are mainly related to waves in the in the flow path, uh, every hair for given waves, or other reason that uh, we, we will see later. So, in addition to this uh, new load, we have to sum an alternating load. So at the end, uh, the scenario will be that one. And this is uh, very bad for, uh, for materials, because you have uh, microscopic fracture. With this behavior of the stress, this microscopic fracture became macroscopic <laughs> and then these fractures are going to, to increase their dimension until the material is broken. The crack uh, became so large that the material is not uh, enough resistant to react uh, to the load. And then you have uh, a peak load that breaks your components and this is so bad. Now we have to detect which are these uh, cycle load, which is the cycle that stress the component. We can uh, divide the, the fatigue cycle in two kinds of fatigue, low cycle fatigue and high cycle fatigue. The difference are, are two mainly. One, the low cycle fatigue is uh, a fatigue that doesn't involve a large number of cycles, but uh, there is an higher alternated stress. The high cycle fatigue is the opposite. You have a lot of cycle, but not so much alternated stress. How can it translate in the engine, in operative life of the engine? So, what is low cycle fatigue? The engine starts off, then goes to take off, then it, start, it shut down. Next flight, off, take off, shut down off the cuff, shut down, and go and go and go. So each flight is a cycle. The engine will do a lot of cycle like that, and it is the low cycle fatigue, the, the base of low cycle fatigue in the life of the engine. You will have other uh, part of the operating, operating condition that give some damage, but this is the zero takeoff is the most uh, important part of the low cycle fatigue of the engine. Then you have also a high cycle fatigue cycle. What is that? The blade is uh, rotating, the nozzle is taking the stress from the air, you have your mean stress. How I was uh, saying before, there are some vortex, there can be some vibration in the engine that had an alternating stress to that average stress. So, here, think about the takeoff, you are at the maximum uh, load, and you will add a little bit of uh, vibration, and you add this load. Okay, so we used the height diagram to, to detect the material properties of a, of a part. So we have to resist to a combination of static and alternating stress. Usually, <coughs> I build a chart in which in the x-axis I have the mean stress and the y-axis I have the alternative stress. In a static condition without alternating load, this is my value. I don't of the material properties. So the material will survive if I have a load that is lower than my maximum static load and will break if I have a load that is higher than this value. If I have an alternated stress, I cannot survive with the same mean load, but the material need to survive to have a lower mean load. So at the end, if I increase uh, the alternating load, so if the alternating load is increased, I have to reduce the mean load in order to make the parts survive. So here I have in a safe zone. 
why there I have in the Raptor Jones zone. If I work there, material is breaking because uh, respect to the my material breaking point, I have in a higher new load and also in a higher alternating load respect to this point. So material will break down. This uh, material property depends, of course, from material, but uh, also from the number of cycles that are required to the, to the part. If the part marches to a certain number of cycles, this is the curve. If the part uh, must resist to an higher number of cycles, I cannot uh, have the same stress, but uh, my stress is reductive. Uh, the stress that I can, uh, I can think is uh, lower, otherwise I break the component. So, this became the curve increasing the number of cycles. The point is always the same, because if I have not alternative stress, actually I have not cycle. So, I start from only a static stress, I have not cycle. Cycle is not uh, meaningful into the parameter at this point. If I increase the number of cycles, I can reduce the alternative stress that uh, affect the part. <laughs> Previously, I was talking about LCF, low cycle fatigue, and HCF, high cycle fatigue. So, in low cycle fatigue, I have not so much, so many cycles, but I have an higher alternated stress. I can allow it in the mirror. And so I am working here. For high cycle fatigue, I have a, an higher number of cycles and a lower alternated stress. And I am working here. At the end, the difference between these uh, two cycles is that in the low cycle fatigue, the stress can be higher than the yield stress of material, so I can have some portion of the, of the component that uh, have a permanent deformation, but small portion. Resonance, flutter, the other. Okay. 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 We have a final hour. And uh, we'll try to give the you. So Marco tried, uh, we did the uh, we had the three objectives today. One, understand how a turbine works. What is a turbine? An engine. No? So the LPT is tied to the fan, which are the main parts of the turbine, the vein, blades, which are the objective of each part of the casing to contain the flow the vein that are tied to the casing, the blades that are tied the one with the other with the arms to take the, the thrust to the fan and to a disc that is transforming centrifugal stress into central stress and so on, okay? How to prevent the bypass. Second, alpha mechanical so an airfoil is done of a specific material. This material can resist to a specific stress as a function of the temperature uh, that component is working. And the stress uh, are different from the vein. Maybe they are loading the stress. On a blade, they are centrifugal stress. And so the blades have to be thicker and longer at the up, sustain on the top part, a vein on the contrary at the tip to sustain the moment of the beam loads. 
The third part I want to explain to you that perhaps has been shown by you in the aerodynamic lessons you had, lesson you had uh, with the professor La Rocca yesterday or two days ago, I don't know when, is uh, how the aero design of a profile, no? Because what we'll ask to you is to imagine a new profile that could resist to the stress condition. So, for this you need the basic, and for this too. Because you could not suggest us to do a blade that is flying, it needs to be tied somehow there. All the blades need to be tied to the other to take the thrust to the fan. We have to prevent the bypass uh, over the blades uh, at the moment we are doing with the thin sensor. But let's now focus uh, the last hour or the, on the arrow of the sun. What I want to do to you understand is what is good and what is bad from an arrow point of view. What is good? What I need uh, a vein to do, a profile to do. What I want is the uh, transform the flow that is trying to go in this direction due to the different pressure, taking the flow from here and accelerating uh, this way. This is what I want, this is what is good. I want the flow to be taken and push as fast as possible on the rotor. I take the flow. Here I have another thing. This is a channel where here is larger, larger than here. So, what I obtain is that I compare the flow to go in this direction due to the geometry I give to this uh, blade, vein, therefore, but also I make the channel more and more uh, thin, uh, short. What I do, if you have a channel that is converging, the flow will accelerate from here to here because uh, all the mass flow will have to go here. So the flow here is accelerating and also going in the direction I want. So what is good? Good is giving direction in the sense that I move the flow from a direction I push towards the blade after, no? in that direction, and I accelerate the flow. This is good, okay? What is bad? The flow here is moving 200 meters per second, very fast. <coughs> The vein is fixed. The profile is there, zero meters per second. So you have flow that is going very fast and a surface that is fixed. What can happen? That the flow, when it moves here, so in all these parts, the flow is going really fast. But I need this solid, to make it uh, move uh, towards where I want and to accelerate. That are the good things. But as a consequence, or having the fast flow near to a fixed geometry, what is going to happen? Anyone know? Can you repeat the question? Sorry? Can you repeat the question? As a consequence of the no, fact... 
Yeah, uh, do you know what is happening when I have a fixed surface and a flow that is going very fast? No? We have a gradient of velocity. Yes, yes. We create what is called the boundary layer. I have uh, in the, the, the surface is fixed, zero velocity. Here is 200 meters per second, no? There should, the velocity cannot change uh, suddenly from 200 to zero. Somewhere there will be a layer where the flow goes from zero to 200, no? Is uh, a thin layer near the profiles, but there is a zone where the flow is going from zero to 200 meters. This is the surface of the ice. This is the flow going at 200 meters per second. From here to here, I have to go from zero to 200, so the flow will have to accelerate. Okay? Is it clear? <coughs> okay. So, I have two layers, two particles of flow, this and this one. One is moving very fast, one little less fast. This is causing friction. Because uh, the particle that is going lower is uh, pushing uh, to go faster from the top of one, while the other, the, the other way, one is trying to reduce the velocity of the other. So I'm creating friction. So in this part, uh, I create uh, losses. This uh, surface try to decrease the velocity of the undisturbed flow. No? So something I don't want, the first uh, bad thing is friction. Due to the surface, I have a friction. And friction will reduce the velocity I could achieve, dissipating it, transforming instead of energy, cinetic energy, thermodynamic uh, enthalpy in a cinetic energy that is the good thing I want, generating just uh, heat, dissipating uh, the, 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 the energy, and I don't want that. Then there is another consequence of the boundary layer. And, and here we finish, and you have to understand this. And then I ask you all uh, to have understood this because of the unity. So you have the boundary layers. But what is a boundary layer? Is the thin layer of air where the flow, the velocity goes from zero on the surface to the maximum velocity of the good flow in the center of the channel. Okay? I can see these are two adjacent uh, airfoil. Where I have the boundary layer? Can someone come here and design here the boundary layer? Come here if you want. This view is seen from the top, you know? You are seeing uh, two profiles. Yes, luckily we have thinner than this, but this is the boundary layer. No? So here I have the mean flow, and here instead I have the flow that will go from zero to the maximum velocity. Okay? Everyone uh, see this? Okay, so all around, I, I redesigned this, uh, it's more or less correct. 
but more or less uh, the boundary layer will start from here, will develop, and we will develop more uh, on the suction side than on pressure side later. On. Probably I'll uh, explain you why, but at the moment it's not important. <coughs> I have boundary layer here and here, and here and here. Okay, boundary layer, so a zone where the velocity of the flow is really small compared to what is happening here. And I'm generating friction here. While here, I mean, I have no losses. Okay? There are other two places where I have the boundary layer. It's not just this. She did a good job, but forgot to design two boundary layers. Here, I'm seeing from the top. If I see from here, from here I saw, uh, let's design it this way. So let's suppose that uh, this is uh, the height of this profile and this is the head of this profile. So I'm looking from here. This is the gauge there, no? Here you have the profile. This is what I call the upper, the bottom part, this is the tip. Let's suppose this is a beam. Well, you see this is a fixed a beam. Well, it is a fixed. Upper tip. Tip at the casing. Let's suppose it's a rotor. When is more stressed? If it's a rotor, when is more stressed? No, the rotor at the arm, because it's pissed at the arm. <coughs> and, okay, let's suppose it's a vein, which is the main cause of stress? The forces of the flow. If instead it's a blade, uh, the centrifugal stress. But uh, this is not what I'm trying to tell you now. If this is the same view from here, you have... Uh, Boundary layer all around the rows, and this is what she designed here. But you have a boundary layer elsewhere. We don't know where. Anyone can design it. You have metal here, you have metal here. Here it passes the undisturbed flow. This gap uh, is this one. No, but here and here you have metal. You have uh, the casing, uh, the platform, the inner platform, and so on. So, if you have metal here, the velocity here is zero. The flow is going very fast. So, you have the boundary layer not just here and here, so around the profile, but also here and here. Over the road, you mean? Yeah, I mean, because the wind screening, uh, there are those, those blades and planes that are pushing that those boundary layers, layer, it's like uh, really fast. Right? Yeah, but the, the boundary layers on the platform are also being pushed or like perpendicular because in my head. Yeah, I'm going there. I'm going there. Yes. Okay. We are going the uh, next step, uh, I'll go there. Wait a moment. At the moment I'm just telling you that you have uh, solid surfaces here, here and here, 
So all around the surfaces you have a boundary layer. And so friction, but something else. The main flow, the good things is this one. Let's focus a moment on what is happening to an aerosurface and how a aerosurface works. This is a profile. You, you see, there are two different parts in this profile. The top part and the bottom one. They are different. And you see they are different, no? Let's call this the leading edge. And this the trailing gauge. The flow arrives here and exit here. No? But you see that this part is really different from this part. Tell me which are the differences. The first difference is that this is longer than this. No? Because this way is shorter than this. Let's suppose uh, you have uh, two particles of I coming here, one and two. They arrive together on the leading edge. Then one is taking this trip, the other this one. Which of the two particles will arrive before the other? The bottom one will arrive before the top one, right? Everyone agrees? No, that's wrong. They arrive together. Because if they arrive one before the other, what it means? That somewhere I generate mass or there is a discontinuity. I create a, a, a node in the space. No? So, the two particles will have to come together, but this one will have to go through a shorter way. This one a longer way. How? This one will be faster. This one will be uh, slower. Okay? Because they have to arrive together. If not, uh, I create uh, no material somewhere. That is not good. <coughs> if where is uh, slower, the pressure will consider the pressure <coughs> as the total pressure minus uh, the velocity. Very easy and compressible and so on. No? When the velocity is lower, the pressure is higher or lower? The pressure is higher. So if I have lower velocity, the particle has more time to go to hit the, the uh, surface. And that's the pressure. What is the pressure? If you put an end, the pressure are the particles that hit you. If those particles are going less in another direction, have more time due to their, uh, because particles are not just going in that direction, but the temperature is the fact that they are translating here and there in a randomic way, way no? If they stay more here, because they move less, uh, they have more time to hit the surface. And that's the pressure. Every time they hit, you feel any pressure, no? So, 
they are slow, and so here they have high pressure. More time this particle will hit the surface. <coughs> this one will go faster, so you have lower pressure. Okay, so if I have higher pressure, lower pressure, what will happen? If this is a rotor, something very important. It happens that you have a force acting in this direction, from plus to minus, right? And this is how a rotor is working. The plane lift uh, is the same. The wing uh, is done something like this. What is, where is the pressure and what is uh, the suction of this uh, uh, wing? If this is the wing of an airplane. This is suction, this is pressure, this is plus, this is minus, because here I have lower velocity, here I have higher, and I have a lift this way, and the plan uh, flies. But there is another consequence. <coughs> This is the good consequence. I create uh, a delta pressure, so it rests on the blade. But the other consequence is that uh, somewhere uh, near the first, uh, I have another rope, another uh, blade. And this blade has here the suction, so less pressure here plus. You see? <coughs> if I have a lot of pressure here and less here, what will happen? Will happen what uh, I said uh, when I open the door and here I have higher pressure and there less. The higher will try to go that way. From where I have more pressure, more particles, to where I have less. No? So, because here I have more particles, they are trying uh, to go this direction. Is it possible to go in that direction when I have a flow that is running so fast in the perpendicular direction? Because these are 200 meters. No, in this part. So in this part, here I have the pressure side plus here I have the suction side. So here I have more pressure, <coughs> and here I have less. These are pressure, <coughs> and these are less. But here it's difficult that the flow could go from here to here. Why? Because if it's starting to go in that direction, there is the main flow that is going too far, so fast that it's taking over everything uh, and taking with the heat, okay? But there are uh, places where this movement can happen. In this view, it's easy to be seen. Try to discover where. I say that there is a push of the air from plus where I have more pressure to less, the other center row, the suction side, no? But here I cannot go because I have too much flow. I have too much flow going too fast to prevent it there. But we design zones where the velocity is not so high. Where? Which zone? The boundary layers. No? Here and here. There, what we say that because there you have you are near the flow, the surfaces, the flow is going very slowly. Not 200 meters, but slowly. And here so the flow can go from plus to minus, can go in this direction. 
I have created a weaving, a way where the flow can go in the opposite, in perpendicular direction to the main flow that should go in this direction. No? So I have two flow, one and the other, one and the tip, that are going from pressure to suction side this way, perpendicular to the right way. Okay? This is the main cause of what is called secondary flows. I dissipate energy to create a, mov a movement that I would like not to have. I don't need that movement because each movement causes dissipation of energy. And this is this movement I want. I'm creating this ring. This, no. No? But it's a direct consequence of the boundary layer at the upper, the tip and the plus or minus. Wait a moment. Why I said that these two particles could not arrive one before and the other after? For the conservation of mass. You cannot create or destroy mass. They have to arrive together and so on. And the same principle will apply here. If I have a flow that is going from here to here, where is this flow coming from? <coughs> the flow that is going from here to here, first of all, from here should have to move somewhere. And in order to go from here to here, we have to arrive from somewhere. Maybe the flow will be fit by here, and once it arrives here, it will arrive in this way. So I'm creating a flow that will do this way and a little this way. <coughs> okay? If you look to here, maybe the flow, and let's suppose this is the upper. The flow from here will start to go towards the other row, and when it arrives on the suction side, it rises up. If you plot uh, this uh, surface, this is this surface, and you'll see this is the training gauge. This is the training gauge, you will see something like this. When it arrives here, it rises up. On the other hand, uh, this part, uh, the flow will feed this from the top. Always for the same reason. Because the main flow, the main flow will not uh, feed the depth because it's so energetic uh, that it has no interest, no way to, to, to look at uh, this minor concept. But in this boundary layer, the flow is uh, slow, slow, and so can go to feed this. What I draw here is what generally we see defined in this way, through two big control rotating vortex that are going at the upper the tip from the pressure to suction side, going down from the pressure of the profile in the bottom part and towards the tip at the tip part of the pressure and the other way at the other. And this is the main secondary flow. There are other secondary flow, but before doing that, uh, I want you to I want to be sure you understood uh, this one. Can some of you come here? So I have the view from the top. 
They view from here. And the view and the view on uh, this section and this section that's called B and C. Okay, let's try to design here the effect of this secondary flow on uh, this different view. This section, if uh, we have here and the other for here and the deep, what will happen? I'll have the generation of boundary layer, but also I have a boundary layer here. That is uh, a, a here and here. So I have boundary layers on the blades <coughs> and on the angles. Okay? Then I have more pressure here less pressure here due to the fact that here the velocity will be higher or lower higher no because the surface is longer than the bottom part so higher means lower uh, pressure because uh, the the particle has less time to go to hit the surface. And here, the flow, so we go from plus to minus because I'm near the angle. So the secondary flow here will be something like this. Is it clear this? this? Okay, here, this is one row, this is the other uh, airfoil. So here we go from, this is, uh, let's suppose this is the pressure side, so this view, <coughs> and this is uh, suction side. On the contrary, here I have pressure, and here I have suction on the other side. No? So here I have this movement, this movement inside the boundary layer, the zone where the flow is uh, low velocity, but I have to fit that, so I have a movement of flow here, and here, and here. So I have this flow, and this flow. Two main counter rotating voltages. You see those? B to B is what I'm seeing here, on this suction side surface. This is a field, the upper, this is the field. So here, the flow will go from the pressure side towards the suction side. I said, at a certain point, it hit here, near the upper. Here it's arriving the flow, coming from the suction side of the adjacent uh, uh, row. And it's going up. These are the other. At the tip, the same. Something like that. So this is a suction side. The flow from the pressure side is going toward the suction and rising up. Suction side minus pressure is rising up. You see? The pressure side, so if I look instead of this surface, the flow is going from the pressure side to the suction. But in order to make that possible, I have to feed it from the, from the, uh, the mid span, from the mid part. No? 
And so what it happened here is that the flow will enter this way, but will go towards the field, towards the earth. No? This is the leading gauge, this is the trailing gauge, this is the leading gauge, trailing gauge, that is, this is the leading gauge, and this is the trailing gauge. Flow is going in this direction. These are the up and these are the feet. So, where is the good here in the mid? In the mid, the flow is going undisturbed. No? But near the profile, I have boundary layers of friction, and near the angle, I have also boundary layer, and due to the consequence of the movement of the flow around here, the delta pressure, I have this secondary flow. <coughs> In this view, this part on the center is the good one that is working without losses, that is mainly this part, while around the surfaces, on the type or on the angle, I have boundary layer. And there I have friction and secondary flows. If I look at the pressure side from up to, to the suction side from up to tip, I have this part that is good because it's not influenced by secondary flow, even if even here I have a boundary layer, but it's only causing friction, not secondary flow because too far from the angle. And on the pressure, this part. I think it's too difficult. I have a question. How much? Uh, is it like working with uh, like more different kinds of iron uh, And like, what is that? Symmetric? 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 Uh, is there any difference between the other and the second floor? The board is symmetric and unsymmetric. Do you catch Marco the question? Yes, what you are asking is whether there is a difference in a symmetric and unsymmetric airport. Okay, symmetric airport. Symmetric airport. Symmetric airport. Symmetric airport. With the non-symmetrical airport, you will have forces uh, over without any other of the only the shape of ah, okay. the <laughs> it's that in a line we have unsymmetrical micro with a full material and we do a couple of incidents so we find this three way of jumping it. Yeah if uh, with a symmetrical airport you mean that something like this Without such, <laughs> something like that, eh? without suction and pressure, here what you have is only frictional losses. Because they will still have a boundary layer, but they will not generate any pressure side and suction side because here the length is the same so the two particles can move in the same velocity and so I have not a reason why the flow should go from a blade to the other unfortunately if I have not this it's good because I have no secondary flow but I'm not doing any work because uh, if I have a plus here and minus here, I have what I'm trying to do. No? I have to accelerate the flow, I have uh, to give a delta pressure to move the rotor. So, yes, I avoid completely the secondary flow, but I'm not doing what I have to do in that case. Okay. <coughs> Can I erase all of this? 
This is the main passage vortex that is generating that for two reasons. The first is because I have a boundary layer. <coughs> the second is that it's because I have an interpressure between the, the two sides of an eye. So I have the main passage vortex, that is going, the one we have just seen, that is going from pressure to suction side. There is another important vortex. When the flow arrives here, it creates, uh, in front of the leading edge, a zone where uh, of stagnation, a zone where the velocity is zero. And so the flow tries to go, as I said, uh, will separate uh, a part on this side, a part on the other side. So I'm creating uh, two legs uh, of this uh, flow, one going in this direction, one on the other direction. If I am near the angles, this flow will be taken by the main push due to the delta pressure and pull it, push it towards the suction side. So the flow that is arriving here near the leading edge and will split the part on the suction side, part on the pressure side. The part on the pressure side will be pushed towards the suction side, even more from the delta pressure. On the other hand, the part that will go on the suction side will then instead be pushed again on the suction side. Okay? So, this is called the horse show vortex. Because uh, you are creating something similar to what is an horseshoe. Maybe you have a vortex, a leg of this vortex, the one on the suction side, that is pushed back towards the suction side, and the other leg that is instead going also on the suction side, but from pressure to suction. Okay? So mainly, you will have the flow arriving here, part uh, is if you are near the angle, will do something like that, and part something like that. Not going uh, near the angles, around uh, the airport as you wish. And then you have the other vortex that will take flow, the main passage, <coughs> that will take flow moving it this way. Unfortunately, this flow are counter-rotating, and so we start to interact together and rotate one on the other until the end. Okay, but uh, I don't want, uh, it's not a necessity to understand exactly how they are in a 3D. I tried to. What is important uh, is this I brought in the beginning. What is good and what is bad in a turbine. What is good? Take the flow and give the right direction. So, on a vein, accelerate and push it towards the road. How I accelerate, how I push. Can someone ask her? By making more narrow the This is for accelerating or pushing? Accelerating. Yeah? 
and uh, to give the right direction, just making uh, the profile uh, in the direction I want to go, okay? Okay, so accelerating, decreasing the throw of the profile and giving direction moving on the beam towards the blade, the blades then will take the flow, transform uh, the, the, the velocity in uh, the throw, the thrust in, uh, in loads and for the uh, second principle we move on the other direction the velocity that will have to be accelerated again and so on. What is bad is friction. What is friction due to? The fact two effects, the but mainly one, the, a flow is viscous. A flow cannot have an infinite velocity here, a, a, diff, a concrete difference in velocity just near to them. If I have that, I generate losses, Reynolds stresses. So friction, due to the fact that I have a solid surfaces still, not moving at the same velocity of the flow, and secondary flow that are generated from <coughs> delta pressure and the boundary liquids. Is it more or less understandable? So, if I ask, when I ask you, and we have finished, in the eight hours uh, course, you'll have to think ways, you'll be divided into several groups. You'll have to think a way to design profiles to increase the good and decrease the bad. What is an easy answer? And I think, it, I don't know the answer, I know some answers. But I don't want to make you focus on this. Now I'm giving some ideas. No? But uh, what you should do? You should uh, continue to give the right direction and accelerate the flow, because this is the ba basic principle. And uh, you also need uh, to make the profile still resistant enough to don't break. But now you can do profile completely different. No? I can add the surfaces, I can add what I want, no? make it uh, complex, because additive is allowing us that. But the objective is to reduce friction and, increase, uh, sec uh, and decrease uh, secondary force. Some examples. For example, you can look at what uh, nature has better. No? For example, the waves on the fins have some tubercles that uh, will take the flow, accelerating it in a certain way between that, if you look at the image uh, of, a tuber of a wave, Avoiding uh, the horseshoe vortex, <coughs> or uh, so, and, and there are a lot of uh, natural examples of fast animals that uh, you could take ideas from. No, there are the horse, there are uh, uh, the, 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 the oaks, and, and uh, the, the sharks. For example, the shark skin is done in a specific way to decrease the friction. If you look at the microscope, the shark skin, they have strange characteristics that are mainly creating, reducing the friction on the boundary layer. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if uh, La Rocca has been able in four hours to explain you something more about the boundary layer. 
characteristics like a laminar boundary layer or a turbulent boundary layer. I don't think so. I'll try to do fast at the beginning of this uh, workshop, of the workshop. No? Other things uh, you can do is uh, to copy from other, other uh, technical solutions. Fast uh, cars, uh, airplanes, uh, yacht, uh, so fast boards, and so on, uh, have already developed uh, solutions to do the same things that we want to do. If uh, you have to think of ways to erase the boundary layer or to give its characteristics to the grids depiction or to accelerate more the flow also inside the boundary layer or to remove the secondary flow. <coughs> I think I'll give you some example at the beginning of the workout, something we are trying to do. No? But I would like each group, uh, let's try to understand what I am explaining and try to think how can you do something to go against uh, what is bad, still keeping what is good. I know it's not easy, and uh, you still miss uh, some info. I'll take another uh, half an hour to close at least the two important things at the beginning of the workshop to give you a few other info, but these are the main one, no? We'll be with you all the eight hours to help you thinking about it, no? But we really want you to think out of the box. We have been always doing this way, and you have seen it for the first time today. So perhaps uh, let's say your imagination free and try to imagine something strange, no? If you have some interest in some other uh, fields, and you know something strange, it's always from a dynamic point of view, as I say, this machine, uh, uh, blades of wings, uh, or uh, wings, uh, uh, plants, or something like that, I don't know. Let's try to think about it, okay? And, and we'll be there to help you with I don't know what will come out, if anything, we will try to give you some idea and we will be able to do so. At least uh, trying uh, to understand how some ideas we already have uh, could work in one. And at least uh, you will uh, demonstrate, uh, you will be compelled to understand what we try to, to, to teach to you. Okay, I think we finish at the time. It's right.